ready? It's the roundtable with me, Robert Bannon. All right, so I'm very excited about our next guest. You know, my parents um, are these good, loving, little New Jersey hippie singer songwriter fans. And I was so excited to talk to Terry Roach. I am also from New Jersey. So come on, Park Ridge, New Jersey. I'm here in Richfield and I'm so excited to talk to her about this beautiful. The only problem I have with the book is she was so lovingly sent me a copy. I just need to meet her so she could sign it. I am so excited to have Terry Roach here. Welcome to the round table. Thank you for having me. And it's really nice to be on your show. It's a, I was going to say, I'm not going to ask for your phone number. I'm not going to ask your age. Uh, I, I know your music. I, I know the music of uh, uh, of you and your sisters for sure. And um, I was listening to you, you all this afternoon in my fifth grade classroom here in New Jersey where I teach. And um, we were listening to your song of your song, the songwriting that has the language that we can show in fifth grade. And uh, <laughs> and I was going through this book. Thank you for sending me a copy. Well, thank you for having me on your show and for appreciating the copy. No, well, if you want to get your copy before we talk about it, you can go to your website. There's a link. <laughs> Here we go. And you could order your copy of Can You See the Sun right now. And firstly- oh. Robert, can you, can you see that sun? Can you see, I'm, I'm, you're right, that sun. My yes. apologies. Can you see that sun? Right. And what I loved about this book, Terry, is that you have, A, the historical parts of your career, like, mm -hmm. like the newspaper articles and whatnot, but the illustrations are done by you as well. Yes, and they're beautiful. And what I read, which I never knew and found fascinating, is you used to draw your set lists and make, these are actual set lists from your shows. Yes, and I used to make a set list for each of the three of us in the band and for the sound engineer. And I would put them on the table in the dressing room and each person would take theirs onto the stage. I kept all of mine, so I have two boxes of all the set lists from every Roaches show. But Suzy used to leave hers on the stage, and people would, you know, take them. So over the years, you know, some I'd hear from someone that said, "I've got your set list from Milwaukee in 1992." <laughs> that is so well. The the art is beautiful, and Thank the song. You. The songwriting and the poetry, of course, we know is beautiful. And the love letter you really tell to your family and, and to your sisters and to, to the fans and to music in general is beautiful. It's beautiful. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that very much. You know, it's like after so much time, uh, you look back. Uh, I'm going to be 70 in April. So... Um, you know, you look back over the whole thing and, you you know, there's a quality of magic that mm -hmm. happened and you think, what was this whole thing? And so to be sent these recordings out of the blue of me and Maggie when we were teenagers, you know, leaving, kind of leaving the nest in New Jersey and getting this great opportunity to go all over the country to these college campuses. I didn't have any recordings of us at that time. So to receive these in 2019 was when I was given these recordings. And then I played some of them for my friend, Lisa Brigantino, and she, if you look at the credits, she's the co-producer with me She's a wonderful musician herself. But when she heard these, she said, oh, you've got to put this out, you know. And so that was the beginning of working on the project. And then Michael Tannen, who had managed Maggie and I, you know, back then when we did the Seductive Reasoning record in, you know, the early 70s, he jumped in on, there we go, there's, <laughs> There's the album from 1975, came out. And Michael and I started into this process of trying to find people that worked on the seductive reasoning record, but also people that 
remembered meeting us on the coffee house circuit, traveling around the country. And we did 19 interviews with different people like on the phone. And, and then so the quotations in the book are all things that I picked out of those interviews in order to try to tell the story of this thing that was the beginning for me of becoming a musician. And what she's talking about is there's there's photos and there are quotes from articles, but I have never, Terry, I've never seen this done before. And it's so brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> the lyrics of the song with your artwork, and then you come over here and there's a QR code that you scan and it takes you directly so you can hear. I have never, and it's such a brilliant idea. How did the idea come to put it all together like this? Well, I had an amazing team of people that helped me. Um, as I say, Lisa and Michael um, Tannen, and then Tom Milioto, he took, he's also a wonderful musician himself, but he took all of the recordings and some of them were from 1973, some were from 2000, and two of them were outtakes from Seductive Reasoning. And he took them and, and really worked on them to restore them. There was no mixing involved because they were straight off the board in live situations with in front of an audience. And um, so as we went along, I, as you can imagine, had to you know sift through I had been sent about 65 recordings all told and I had to sift through and decide which ones should go in this book. And as I was listening to them, I started to realize that these songs need to be presented with a certain level of dignity. You know, people were saying to me, Robert, they were saying, Oh, you've got to do vinyl, you know? And I'm like, Vinyl, you know, you open the thing and the lyrics are like real small. And I started to realize that presenting these lyrics, most of which Maggie wrote, a couple I wrote parts of or whatever, I thought they need to be presented with dignity. And so I started doing the drawing, which was very natural for me to do since I always lo love to draw. And then as the project went on and I was sifting through the transcripts of all these interviews with the various people, picking out quotes, how am I going to explain what this was? Because it was unusual for two teenagers to set off, you know, Ridgefield is a couple <laughs> towns away from Park Ridge, right? Yes. Right? You know, and everyone... You haven't asked this question, for, but most people have asked me the question, how, what were your parents thinking to let you go oh. off and do this, you know? And it, it's, it's hard to really describe those times. Very different from these times. Sure. You know, I went back recently to Park Ridge High with a friend. We wanted to go walk on the football field. We walked up the steps and there's the gate that we had to come in, the security gate. They had to let us into the little thing. And then we went to the office and we said, you know, we just, we went to school here. You know, I'm class of 1971 and my friend was 1975. And they said, I'm really sorry. We can't let you walk. I said, we just want to walk on the football field. I'm sorry. You know, I was like, we walked out of there thinking, wow, this is a different time period yeah. entirely, you know, and the school looks the same. Uh, that's, but I, I totally understand. You know, I had family that grew up in Park Ridge. They, my, um, my Aunt Fran and my Uncle Louie and their daughter Louise grew up in Park Ridge, going to Park Ridge, the diner in Park Ridge and all of the Jersey, you know, by the right. reservoir in Park Ridge. And, you know, it's a beautiful town, but this, the way the world, you know, to get in the car and drive across the country and play in, in coffee houses and colleges and, and be on the road. And it's, it's such a different world. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you have really encompassed it. 
and explained it so well in this. For people that have not read the story or are not uh, fully familiar, The Bitter End Coffee House, you, you, how do you end up there? And how does how does this this opportunity even present itself to you? Well, well, you can imagine. So our our father had a job in the city, so he would commute on the red and tan bus line mm -hmm. from Park Ridge into New York. And he had a friend, Sam Salant, who was an artist, and they were seatmates on the commuter bus. And Sam was very kind of progressive for the town, you know. And he um, suggested to my father, oh, you should bring the girls in to audition for Izzy Young, who had a show on WBAI, a folk show, a folk music show. So we had already started playing together. And I think in the book, you know, it tells the story of how we, our first performances were for local uh, candidates in the Democratic Party in Park Ridge. And of course it was a Republican town, you know? So in those days, it was, it was all fun. Like my, uh, Okay, I'll show you. Wait, wait one second. Please, absolutely. I'm fascinated. This is amazing. Okay, so check this out, right? I was so enamored of playing these campaign songs for the politicians, right? So in the in these in the uh, yearbook, right? In the eighth grade yearbook in Park Ridge. It, you had to say what you wanted to be when you grow up. So hold on a second. You're gonna, There's me. There's you. And I see it says, I see Park Ridge and I see your name. And let's see if we can, we're going to try to. And you're going to have to help us out. But I see it. I see it, it says Terry Politician. Right. It says Terry Politician. They asked you, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, politician, because we were we were playing for the Democrats, for the senator, state senator, and playing for the governor and, and right, you know, and uh, and so I was all enamored with politicians. And I think about that now. Sure. <laughs> and I think yeah. like, ah, you know, it was I used to love to um, debate with people, you know, and talk about politics and stuff and of course today no i i don't want to even get involved in any of that and i feel so it's heartbreaking to me because we traveled all over the united states and there was no blue states red states i mean i'm sure we were in places that were very different from new jersey we had never been anywhere so the whole thing for us was new, you know? We didn't know the difference between Iowa and Idaho, you know? We, we would encounter each state on its own terms. You know, we were traveling through, we were traveling to the college where we had a contract to play for six nights. And um, it was a remarkable, it was very wholesome in a weird way. Sure. It wasn't... It wasn't like two kids running away from home. You know, it was, we, you know, there was an agency in New York that sent us to the uh, colleges. And to back up a little bit, the way this happened was that our father did bring us in to audition for Izzy Young. And Dave Van Ronk was in the, folklore center visiting Izzy. They were hanging out together and we didn't know who that was. And for all of you who don't know who that is, Dave Van Ronk was a fixture of the 1960s folk revival in Greenwich Village. He was part of a scene that included like Bob Dylan and, uh, you know, Joni Mitchell and Joan Baez and you know, Tim Harden and Tim Buckley and all these people that I had never heard of before. And so Dave 
listen to our audition. And then he took us around the corner to his apartment where we met his wife, Terry Thal, and she uh, became our manager. So I was 15 and Maggie was 16. And now we're being managed by um, Terry Thal, who she's the person who told us about Paul Simon teaching a, a songwriting class. The best story. Right? <laughs> right? And Maggie goes to the building and she sits in the lobby and waits for him to come in, goes up to him and says, Mr. Simon, <laughs> you know, and she tells him, I have a group with my sister. And so he invited us to come back the following week and with you know you can come back with your sister and so then next the following week there the two of us are with our guitars and Robert what we thought was going to happen here was we thought this guy is going to listen to us and he's going to like stop the presses let's bring these two into the studio and wow you know instead he took us into a classroom and we played he said you know okay so play something for me and we played like our best song you know it was our best one and then halfway through he stops us and he says okay play another one and so we play another our second best song, <laughs> you know and then this happened about four times and then he said okay you can join the class and so we, we went and we were in the class and we were not students at NYU, you know, we, uh, so anyway, after class, he, um, asked us where, you know, where are you going? You know, are, do you need a ride somewhere? So we said, well, we're going up to the George Washington bridge to go back, you know, to New Jersey. Sure. He says, I'll, I'll drive you up there. So we get in his car, which is a little sports car. And Maggie's in the front. I'm in the back where there's no room for a person in the back. I'm squeezed in, you know. And he starts saying to us, he said, yeah, he said, you know, you're, you're pretty good. You've probably won all the contests in your local town, you know. And that in the book, that little trophy was in fact from a, a contest that we won in, I think it was Waldwick, you know, at the yes. high school there. <laughs> this trophy right here. All right, there's the trophy. And so, so here's Paul Simon, who we, you know, it wasn't just that he was a famous person. It was, we had a thing about Simon and Garfunkel. You know, we thought of ourselves as we're like the female Simon and Garfunkel, you know, and so, so he he basically says to us, you know, you you have a lot. There's a you have a lot to learn, he says. And so, it's almost like a little bit of a negative tinge, you know, that he's. Mm -hmm. And so then he says to Maggie, uh, "Well, do you think you're as good a songwriter as Paul McCartney?" And she says, "Yes." <laughs> and at that moment, I'm in the back seat. I just had such admiration for her. I thought, wow, that is, that's ballsy, ballsy. that you just word. said yes to that question, <laughs> you know? A good Jersey word, ballsy. <laughs> right. Exactly. And fast, not to fast forward, but he does, his, his company signs you. Well, what happened was, so Terry Thal also got us an audition with the coffee house circuit. So now we audition at the bitter end for them and they come backstage and offer us a contract. Meanwhile, I'm supposed to be a senior in high school. So I'm thinking nobody's going to let me go, you know, and do this instead of go to high school. But instead we went down to the high school and talked to the principal and they worked out, where I would do my homework and send in, do all the term papers, take all the exams so that, <clears throat> because everyone saw that this was an amazing opportunity and 
we shouldn't, I shouldn't have to quit high school in order to take the opportunity. Well, you guys take this opportunity. You mm -hmm. record eventually the seductive reasoning album. And I don't mean to, I want to, I want to ask you of something that very personally touched me in the story. I know it's a fast forward to you. Re, you release that you release the roaches album. Eventually another label, another, your, your other sister. And it's, it's, you're on Saturday night live. It's lauded as the number one album of the year from New York times. And you have all the success and I'm reading the book and I'm listening to the music today in my classroom and I get to the last page of the story. <laughs> yes. And Terry, I don't mean to take your time, but I'm someone who went to high school at Juilliard. I was a musical theater person and a musician. And I went on an audition for Rent on Broadway. I had a bad audition. And the next day I became an education major and I gave up the business. Right. I did not think that it was for me. Mm -hmm. And I called the, my one man little cabaret show unfinished business because it was about coming back to something that I felt I was supposed to do. It really touched me to read the story. And I, I related so much to the thought process you all had. Do you mind sharing what this page in the book is, is about? The no, not, not at all. And I have to say thank you so much for noticing <clears throat> that page in the book, because for me, I'm really speaking to, I know many people that have had this type of thing happen. You know, here we were signed to a major label and the story I tell in the book is called The Folder. And it was when the record was done, Seductive Reasoning, it came out and we went on this short tour. We went to Chicago, we went to San Diego, we went to LA and it was arranged for us to play in a club, in small clubs in each place. And in LA, <clears throat> someone from the record company took us out to dinner, he and his wife. And so he, he takes us out to dinner and uh, they seemed like they really enjoyed our show, you know, and um, we get back to New York and now there was a certain amount of pressure from the record company for us to look differently than we did. Like we weren't glamorous enough. It was like, could you, you know, um, and so they, they took us shopping, you know, the product manager took us shopping to Bloomingdale's to like, let's get some out. You should have an outfit that really for stage, you know, but as you can see on that cover <laughs> of seductive reasoning, we had our own style of doing things and it was not, glamorous and we thought we don't want to be on the cover of our record looking like somebody else you know so anyway so we get back to new york after the los angeles experience and we're rehearsing in michael tannen's office he gave us the keys to his office where he had a piano so so we didn't have a piano in our apartment but we would go to the office when people were not there and we would rehearse. So we're in there rehearsing our songs and we see on the desk, on his desk, we see a folder that says Maggie and Terry Roach on it. So there it is on the top of the desk, right? And so, you know, it was not nice of us to open that up. It was not our business, but I mean, I, challenge anyone to not open that up and Agreed. see what that is. <laughs> Agreed. Right? Agreed. <laughs> right. So we open the thing up and it's a letter on Columbia Records stationery from the guy that had taken us out to dinner. And it was like a scathing review of our performance, mm -hmm. you know, saying things like they have no idea what to do on a stage. Mm -hmm. And how we looked, and it was just this scathing thing. And as I say in the book, you know, no mention of the music. And so we we started to think we're in way over our heads. We're in the fast lane. We don't belong here. We people don't like our music. You know, it's they they wish we were doing what 
Joni Mitchell was doing or somebody else was doing, you know, it was, it was, we realized that we didn't belong in this situation and we were being humiliated. So shortly after that, we gave up our apartment and we announced to Paul, Simon and Michael that we were leaving, you know, and we, we went to the people in the record company. We explained to them that, um, you know, we were going to bail on this whole thing. And we went down to uh, Louisiana where we had a friend that we had met on the road on the tour uh, who had started a Kung Fu temple in an abandoned building in Hammond, Louisiana. And we went there. We didn't do music. We got waitress jobs. And we were basically thinking, okay, we're a couple of has-beens at the age of 21, you know. And uh, that's where Maggie wrote the Hammond song, down there. And so so in the book, I, I explain that these interviews with all these people, one of the interviews was me interviewing Michael and Michael interviewing me, us having a conversation like you and I are having here. That's when the story about the folder came out. He was never heard that before. He, you know, he, he didn't, he said, you, you looked in a folder on my desk, you know, and here we are on mic, you know, 50 years later, looking at each other. And I told him the story of this because he and everyone else involved was wondering what happened to you guys, you know? It's like even Paul Simon, when we did the interview with him, uh, he, he he said, we, yeah, why did you got, we, I never understood. I thought you were on your way to becoming a, a star. You know, we had this record was gonna get on the radio and what happened, you know? So the folder uh, story, you know, Michael and I are sitting, you can imagine, you know, 50 years later, he's like, that's why you left. We were so humiliated that we didn't want to talk about it. We didn't want it, anyone to know why we were leaving. Um, but we were determined and we, we did leave, you know. So, but the, the thing about the title of that chapter, The Folder, is that, you know, when you fold, you quit. And that was the folder for us. But Terry, what's fascinating and where the book, I hope you write more uh, and I hope you come <laughs> um, because there's a whole other part of your life and your story. That This is just the beginning and um, your career. I don't know if people say this to you. And I mean, in the highest compliment, you your music is ahead of its time. And mm -hmm. there's my unprofessional dogs. And um, your music is ahead of its time. And there's a generation of singer songwriters out there who you have inspired and mm -hmm. the way you tell a story and the conversational nature of the lyric that you are, you feel like you're having a conversation with you in your music. Mm -hmm. um, and um, all of these singer songwriters, uh, people, I was going to say female, it doesn't matter. People, people, songwriters. We just had uh, Dar Williams on the show, or we've had Rufus Wainwright, who I know is, you know, family right. group like them. These songs, they look to you. They look to you and your sisters and, and the music that you you have done. Um, you do you feel that way? Do you feel? Do you see the seeds of your work and sacrifice in other musicians? Yeah, yes, I do very much because we get a lot of feedback from people. Um, <clears throat> like in the book, I tell the story of. Um, Amy and Emily in the Indigo Girls and how they came backstage when they were in high school or maybe after high school, but, and expressed, uh, you know, that they had been influenced by us. And then they had us sing on their record. And, you know, so it, there's been a sense from people of being, having been influenced by us and what we did, which is a nice feeling because you never know if anybody's paying attention, especially when you feel like you're failing, you're not getting on the radio, you're not getting a hit record. And yet people are coming to the shows and they're telling people about 
this shows. And that's why I, I've been saying about this particular re release. Um, people have been saying to me, well, who do you think the audience is for this? And I said, I really think that it's younger people because these songs were written by a teenager, you know? Yes. And, and I feel like, you know, older people, the songs that I'm writing now are, are different. There are different concerns. There's a different view of the world than I had then. And I do think Maggie had this remarkable thing early on with being able to put things into uh, a song that she was feeling, you know, that I think we were swimming upstream because it didn't sound like other things, you know. But I do think that I hear now that people are more open to like, yeah, let's take your guitar and your voice and what what do you got? What, what do you feel like? Who are you? You know? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. That's why I'm saying you you are ahead of your time and you laid a blueprint for all a lot of the singer songwriters that are out there now. I know that you have so many and I would love to have you back because I want to hear about you have project. Hey, you're fascinating. Your your life is fascinating. Your home is fascinating. Your your group, the, the music you're making now is fascinating. Your approach to just singing and, and the circle singing that you do throughout New York and the things that you do. I, I'm going to hold you to meeting up with you one day and getting this signed. Absolutely. I should have signed it for you. No, I need... Um, I would come see your shows, but you just sold out. I mean, you sold out City Winery and did your show. Um, there's there's a there's a beautiful beautiful legacy of music and storytelling that you're leaving. And I want to just before we tell people again, you can go right right on on her website. There you go. The the uh, go to if you go to terryroach.com, you can get uh, a copy. It will lead you right to the website, and then this will be mailed to you. And then not only do you get the story and the photos and the artwork. But like we said, every single song right. code is there so we can hear these actual recordings from them. Right. It, it actually, it is the album as well. So a person can go to the download link and just listen to the whole album. Or you can go through and pick each song, listen and read, you know. <laughs> it was really moving. And I felt very inspired, um, especially by the journey and, and your honesty to tell the story. And and I was really moved as someone who is very close to my siblings, my brother. Um, it, it's really a beautiful story of, of you and your sister. So I, I really thank you for sharing a little piece of your heart, making this art for us. It, it's, well, it's beautiful. Thanks, Robert. And thanks for noticing it and appreciating it. Because if that didn't happen, there would be no uh, book, <laughs> really. It means a lot. So yeah. uh, congratulations. Order Thank your copy. Get your copies uh, today. Go right here. And, and, and it's an honor to talk to you. Yes, likewise. Mm -hmm.